Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me for our webinar about the Rural Dividend Program's 2018 intake in collaboration with my friends from the Rural Programs and Policy Branch. My name is Susan Lowe. I'm with the Design Coordination and Outreach Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade and Technology. I'll be providing technical support for today's webinar and moderating our Q&A session after the stories. I'm located in Victoria on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lake Lungan and Wissanik people. I would like to turn things over to our friends from the Rural Program and Policy Branch, Matthew and Sarah. Why don't you introduce yourselves and we can get things started. Perfect. Thank you very much. And, and before we start, we uh, would just like to take the opportunity to, to thank uh, Susan for all her help in, in setting up the webinar today and for, for running it. It's uh, a huge benefit for us for, to be able to, to reach out to everyone this way. So we, we really appreciate uh, your support, Susan, in, in running this, uh, this webinar today. Uh, so uh, my name is Matthew Scott McCreef. I'm uh, a, a manager with the uh, Rural uh, Policy and Programs Branch. Uh, we're located within the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and Rural Development, and we uh, administer the Rural Dividend Program. Uh, my colleague Sarah will uh, will be presenting with me today. And Sarah is a uh, program um, program analyst with the Rural Dividend Program. Um, again, we're, we're both located within the Rural Policy and Program Branch. Uh, so thank you very much for taking the time to participate in our webinar today on, on the Rural Dividend Program. The purpose of this webinar is to review the application process uh, for the Rural Dividend Program and to provide some recommendations on how to develop a, a strong application. So we will walk you through the online application form, the mandatory documents, and the review process to provide you with some additional information for uh, when you're completing your applications. Along the way, we'll try to answer some of the frequently asked questions, um, but we will uh, also save a lot of time at the end to answer any additional questions that, that you may have. Uh, so the Rural Dividend Program's fifth application intake period is currently open, as I'm sure everyone knows, um, and it will close on July 31st uh, at midnight Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, so this will be the only intake period for this fiscal year, so we strongly encourage anyone who's considering a potential project to submit an application at this time. All potential applicants should visit the, the program website. Uh, we have a lot of information up there uh, on the program, including a, a frequently asked questions page, um, as well as uh, more information on the program. Uh, you can also download the uh, updated program guide, which will uh, provide very detailed information on every aspect of the, the program. Uh, on the website, there's also an application checklist, which includes all of the steps in, in developing and submitting an application, as well as all the required documentation that should be submitted. And then supporting documents are also uh, available on the website, especially the fifth, app, fifth intake uh, budget form, which is a, a key part of our application process. Um, we also strongly encourage applicants to download the application questions uh, for the funding stream that they're interested in uh, ahead of time so that they can prepare their answers in an external document prior to inputting uh, the information into the online application form. Uh, the application questions are available in a PDF document on the, the program website, and by downloading them ahead of time, uh, you just have a, a bit more time to prepare uh, the answers, as well as it's, it's a bit easier to edit outside of the uh, the application uh, form itself. So the online application form is accessed via a link which is displayed on the right sidebar on the Rural Dividend website. Applicants will receive a separate login and password for each application. Unfortunately, the application form at this time uh, does not allow for a customized username and password to be created. Instead, the username and password is a unique combination of numbers and letters. Because this, uh, the, the numbers and letters version for the, the username and password can be easily forgotten, we strongly encourage applicants to either print the login details, write them down, or screenshot the information to ensure that uh, you can access your saved application at a later time. In order to ensure the, the best performance and functionality of the online application form, only one application should be open at a time. This will ensure that the information that you input to the application form 
is accurately saved to the appropriate application. The online application form is reactive, so information, drop-downs, and additional questions will populate based on the, the data that you've inputted. As a result, questions must be answered in order, and the system will not allow for questions to be left blank. You can navigate through the application tabs to information that has already been entered, but you cannot click forward in the form. So the best way to prepare for upcoming answers is to download uh, the PDFs of the application questions from the program website and prepare those answers ahead of time. Uh, there are links included throughout the application form to help you access information that is needed. For example, there's a link to census data to help applicants complete the population details uh, for their community in the, the background section. Additionally, uh, there are links provided uh, throughout the form for information to help clarify particular questions. So for example, if you click on the link titled, Learn More About Outcomes and Indicators, uh, you'll receive additional information on what we are looking for in that section. Applicants should use their legal name when filling out the, organizational, uh, the organization details, and ideally provide two contacts to the application. And this can help us uh, in, our, in any follow-up that takes place during our eligibility review process. The text boxes uh, in the application form contain uh, content limits of approximately 2,500 characters, and the system will display a warning if the limit is near or has been exceeded. Some questions will allow for a longer response. However, more content does not always result, result in a uh, stronger application. And again, we highly recommend that applicants uh, develop their responses outside of the system, such as in a Word document. In this setting, it's, it's a lot easier to review and edit your responses uh, than when the information is in the text boxes on the application form. So the Rural Dividend Program receives a, a large number of applications uh, for a diverse range of projects. The projects are often large and have multiple partners uh, and components and are quite complex. So in order to help us understand the, the key details of your project, it's important to provide answers that are as clear and as specific as possible for each application question. We've identified a few key areas where it is particularly important to provide detailed responses, and I'll just walk through those now. So for the project description, um, the project description is, is a key part of the application because it provides us with an overview of the project and what uh, is accomplished and, and what the applicant is intending. For the project description, it is best to focus on answering two key questions. What is the purpose of the project and what are the project activities? The project description um, is one area where providing as much detail as, as is needed um, to fully describe the project components is, is really recommended. It's also important to keep the project description specific to the project um, or the phase that's specifically being applied uh, for funding. So if the project is linked to a broader initiative or future phases, it's certainly okay to include that information, but make sure that you're clear regarding what specific activities or project components will be completed in this project or in this phase of the project and differentiate that from any future phases um, that, that may take, play to, take place at a later date. In terms of community need, uh, in the community needs section, we are looking for applicants to identify a specific need or needs in the community and explain how the project will uh, work to address it. As much as possible, applicants should provide specific examples and identify links to project activities and identified outcomes. And again, this is a key area of the application. And so providing as, as much detail as possible is definitely recommended. Uh, with regards to community support, we are looking uh, for applicants to provide evidence that clearly shows that the project is supported by the community. Assessing community support is, is a key part of our uh, review and assessment process. So it's important to provide as much supporting information as you have avail available. Please include any letters of support that are specific to the project or if there's any community consultation that has taken place that is relevant to the project or, or speaks to the project uh, specifically, um, that's also great to include. In regards to the community plan, the project does not uh, have to be specifically mentioned in the community plan. If it is, that's great and definitely identify that. But we do recognize that not every project is detailed in the community plan. So if that's the case, if your proposed project is not uh, currently listed, in a community plan, you can provide details on how the project supports the achievement of specific components or goals that are included in the plans, and generally show 
that, uh, that the project's being proposed is consistent with the planning that has taken place in the community and aligns overall with, with the goals of the community. Additionally, the community plan um, that is discussed in the application does not have to be the official community plan for the, for the community. It can be an economic development plan or other relevant plans that have been developed by the community or by your organization. Again, in this section, we really just look to see that the project is consistent with the overall intended direction that the community or the organization has identified for itself. For the outcomes and indicators section, we are looking for the specific things that the project will accomplish, as well as how uh, the project proponent will measure to ensure that they've been completed. So as much as possible, the outcomes in the application should be attributable uh, to the specific actions of the project, and the indicators should be as measurable as possible. So for example, an outcome can be increased training opportunities for small business owners in the community, and the indicator can be the number of training sessions held and the number of participants uh, that, that take part. Um, they don't need to be uh, complex uh, outcomes and indicators, they just need to be focused on the specific actions that will take place during the project and again, provide a clear way to measure if they've been completed. As much as possible, try to avoid broad outcomes that are difficult to attribute to the specific actions of the project, such as the community will double in population size. Again, um, be as clear and, and specific as possible in, in this section. In terms of timelines, when we're reviewing applications, we are looking for reasonable timelines for the project's completion. As long as the project will be completed within the two-year timeline, we do not penalize applicants for how long their project duration is. So definitely avoid being overly ambitious and um, take the time to really show that clear planning um, has taken place and that the timelines are as accurate as possible. As much as possible, try to link the timelines and the milestones to specific project activities that have been detailed in your application. So that way we can see from your project description what will be taking place from the timelines and milestones. We can see how long it will, will take for those to be completed, and then we can link that to the budget to then see how much those activities will cost. In regards to sustainability, if your project will be continuing past the specific project, or beyond this specific project, um, then what we look for is information on how the project will be sustained following the completion of the rural dividend funding. So for example, if the project involves the creation of an ongoing salary position, please describe how that position will be sustained following the end of the program funding. So along with the answers that are provided to the specific questions, um, the applications must also include mandatory supporting documentation. And this is listed in detail on page 15 of the program guide. And I would encourage you to look at that uh, in detail when developing your application. Mandatory supporting documents uh, must be specific to the legal entity that is applying for funding and cannot be uh, from a related organization such as a parent organization. Mandatory supporting documentation uh, is submitted through the online application form. However, there is a limit of 10 uh, documents, uh, approximately depending on the size of the documents, that can be submitted through the online application form. If there are any additional um, Applications, application documents that you would like to submit, you can do so uh, via email. Uh, so financial statements, uh, in terms of financial statements, the program has a tiered approach to financial statements that is dependent on the amount of funding being requested. Uh, more information about the financial statements is included on page 15 and 16 of the program guide. However, generally, um, applicants who are requesting between 10,000, uh, sorry, less than $10,000 in funding, um, are required to submit internally prepared financial statements. Um, and uh, anyone requesting between 10,000 and 100,000 funding is required to provide review engagement financial statements. And finally, uh, anyone requesting uh, more than 100,000 is required to provide uh, audited financial statements. The next, um, the next, um, uh, required uh, mandatory uh, document is Articles of Incorporation. Articles of Incorporation are only required for not-for-profit applicants and First Nation corporations. 
The documents must include the applicant's legal name and business number, and they can either be articles of incorporation or you can submit the most recently filed annual report. Um, the next uh, mandatory supporting document is partnership letters. Partnership letters are only required for applicants to the partnership funding stream. And what we're looking for here is really that the letters must confirm the partner's role and commitment to the project. Finally, uh, or sorry, next is uh, the applicant resolution. So all applicants must complete a council or organization resolution. And these resolutions are, are really meant to show that the uh, organization, uh, what their role would be and their overall commitment to the project for the, the project's duration. Now, due to the, the timing of the application intake period, we recognize that many councils will not be having um, their meetings throughout the summer. And so we have provided an exception to, to this requirement until August 31st. So when you submit your application uh, by the July 31st deadline, if you do not have your resolution at, resolution at that time, we ask that you just identify in the form uh, that it will be forthcoming and identify the date that it will be emailed to the program. And finally, we have the budget form. And so the budget form is, is a key part of the, the application uh, and should be completed using the template that's available on the Rural Dividend website. And my colleagues here will, will go into further detail about that now. So as Matthew mentioned, all applications must include a completed budget form which is using the Rural Dividend FIS intake budget form, and this is available on the Rural Dividend website. All information inputted into this budget form should match the information included in the application and the supporting documents. So for example, the funding request that's been identified in your budget form should match the funding request in your application form. Section one of the budget form is not pictured on the slide here. However, that's where you're going to detail your organization name. So as Matthew mentioned, this name should match your legal name. You'll detail your project name and the funding stream selection that you are applying for funding under. A detailed breakdown of all project costs and their funding source will be inputted into section two of the budget form. So this is pictured on the slide. The left side of the form identifies what information needs to be included for each described cost in the particular category. You're encouraged to identify the most appropriate category for each project cost. However, we should note that during the review and assessment process, the program may recalibrate project costs into other categories in order to, to determine if a project is meeting the program criteria for particular set for particular um, costs related to infrastructure and capital. Unfortunately, within this template, lines cannot be added to the form. So if necessary, applicants are permitted to group two or three project costs onto the same line and then provide a se separate document, such as a Word document, to explain each cost separately. As costs are inputted into section two of your budget form, you're going to notice that section three will begin to auto-calculate. Section three of your budget form is where you will detail all funding for the project. This includes the applicant contribution. So a reminder that the applicant contribution for single applicant requests is 20%, and then the applicant contribution for partnership projects is 40% no more than 10% of the applicant contribution can be comprised of in-kind costs or contributions. In-kind contributions, um, so as noted, cannot account for more than 10% of the overall applicant contribution. So on the form, once your 10% limit has been reached in section 3B, the remaining in-kind contributions will then be automatically filtered into section 3C. When you're detailing funding sources for your project, you can also detail any funding sources that have not yet been verified. So the form will allow you to select yes or no when detailing your funding sources, and you are able to include sources that are not yet verified. Section four of the budget form auto-calculates based upon the information inputted in both sections two and three. The total project cost and total project funding amounts should balance. As such, all project funding should have a corresponding project cost. 
When you're filling out your budget form, if you find that your total project funding is greater than your total project cost, ensure that you go back and review all project activities and make sure that they've been appropriately detailed in Section 2 on your budget form. Moving forward to application review and assessment. When reviewing and assessing applications, we look for evidence of a well-developed project, and usually these types of projects can answer two questions. What is the project and what are you going to do? A strong application can usually describe the project in simple and concise language. If the project contains multiple components, each component is fully described and linked to the overall project description. We look for clear and concise responses. So oftentimes stronger applications tend to avoid the use of what some may call grand rhetoric or buzzwords. And if any acronyms are described throughout the application, they're further defined so that there's no confusion as to what they stand for. Responses that reference project activities as examples usually result in a stronger application. When reviewing the application and supporting documents, such as the budget, timelines, letters, or letters of support, we look for consistency. So ensure that the budget document and any of your letters of support match the project that's being described in your application and all information that's been detailed throughout any supporting documents. So after the intake closes, um, we will complete, uh, the, the, the program staff will complete a, a detailed review and assessment of the applications that were received. And through this review and assessment process, applications um, are, are reviewed and ranked in a competitive process based on program criteria and the suitability of the project in relation to project or to program objectives. Following the program's assessment of the projects, um, they are further reviewed by a committee of senior government officials who develop recommendations, uh, funding recommendations for our minister, uh, which is the Minister of, of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Our minister then reviews all the information that's provided to him and makes the final funding decision. Uh, so we will be completing our, our review process over the rest of the summer and into the fall, and we're hoping to have final funding decisions announced uh, sometime in the, in the late fall. If you would like a status update on the process at any point, you can contact uh, the program office. And so the, the number and the, the email that we have on the screen here is, is for the program office. We have a number of staff who are available uh, throughout the intake uh, period. And our, our main role at this time is to provide support to applicants in developing strong applications. So if you have any questions or uh, any, um, any concerns about, any, or about what we're looking for in any of the application uh, sections, please feel free to give us a call or send us an email and uh, we'll be able to, to answer those questions for you. And then I, I think that's it. So we'll now, if, if anyone has any questions, uh, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to take them at this time. Oh, thanks very much, Sarah and Matthew. So we've got some questions and what I've done is I've organized things into themes uh, based on what has been received. And so we'll just walk through each of the themes and uh, let you answer as we go. So the first theme is around applicants. Um, is most of the funding directed at districts, cities, and bands? And would it be better to partner with those, with the city or district or band for a better chance of funding? So we have seen a, a large number of applications from all three of the, the eligible applicant groups, so local governments, First Nations, and not-for-profit organizations. And we don't have any uh, specific uh, formula for how funding is divided between those, those eligible applicant groups, and, and we don't have any preference uh, between them. So certainly um, all, of those, uh, all of the eligible applicant groups um, have an equal access uh, to, to the funding that's available. That being said, we do always try and encourage applicants as much as, as possible to look at partnering with other organizations within their community or neighboring communities or any groups where there's a, an opportunity to pursue a shared uh, economic development opportunity um, and just to partner to, to increase the collaboration uh, between the two groups and, and the efficiency of the, the project overall. 
So again, um, all, all three of the groups have a, a, an equal access to the funding, but we do encourage as much as possible for applicants to look at, at partnering with other uh, organizations within their community. Awesome, partnership is good. Okay, uh, can we apply for funding for a regional project or should we develop a project specific to a community? Um, so you can do both. Um, the, our, the eligibility of, of uh, applications that are submitted to the Rural Dividend Program is in part uh, dependent on the location in which the project will be implemented. So for a regional project, if it's going to be delivered in, the, let's say, five or ten communities throughout a region, it's uh, critical that in, in the application you identify which specific communities within the region will be taking part uh, in the application and what specific uh, project activities or components will be delivered in each of those communities. So you can certainly pursue a, a regional project um, of that nature, but we just uh, are looking for that additional detail so that we can see, again, where the project activities will take place because we do need to ensure that, um, that it, the project activities will be uh, taking place in communities that meet our eligibility criteria, specifically that they're in communities with a population of 25,000 or less. Um, but again, if, 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 if you're able to provide that, that data, then, then uh, pursuing a regional project definitely fits within our program. Okay. Or again, you can develop a, a project specific to one community as long as that community has a population of, of 25,000 or less. Okay, so for doing a project that takes place in multiple communities, should we have letters of support for each of the communities where we're going to be doing project activities? Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, just to make sure that the the local uh, community is aware um, that the project is going to be taking place in their community and that they're supportive of it. Okay, great. We're going to show up and we're going to do a project in your community. Fun that. Yeah. Okay. Just again, making sure that everyone's aware. Okay. Uh, does having previously received BC Rural Dividend funding, does it impact your assessment of a project for this intake? Uh, so no, it, it does not. So there, there's a limit on the number of applications that each applicant can submit, can submit in each particular intake. And so that is one project development uh, application, which is the the smallest funding stream where applicants can request up to $10,000 to pursue some of the preliminary components um, to develop a, a larger project. And then applicants can also pursue a, a full project in either the single applicant or the partnership funding stream. However, that, th that limit is uh, specific to each intake. And so if you received a funding in a, a past intake, it doesn't impact your ability to uh, pursue funding in this intake or any further intakes uh, in the future. That being said, um, if this project is uh, the second of a, a two or multi-phase uh, uh, project, then what we will look at in the assessment process is um, how much of that first phase has been completed. And we would look to see that there's been good progress and that it's, it's moving towards completion before we would look at funding um, a subsequent phase. Okay, great. A uh, few questions about the logistics. Um, if I've accidentally created two draft applications and not submitted them yet, how do I delete one? So the online application system does not allow for prospective applicants to actually delete an application. But what happens is at the end of an intake period, so um, at 12 o'clock midnight, uh, Pacific time on July 31st, any applications that have not yet been completed will automatically delete from the system. So if you've accidentally opened a second application, simply don't input any information into that application and it'll automatically be removed upon the close of the intake. Okay, phew. Uh, can my coworker and I work on the same application on different computers? Uh, so we have uh, heard from, from other applicants that when people have been working on, uh, when two individuals have been working on the same application at the same time, that uh, work can be lost because if one individual uh, saves and closes the application while the other is working in it, that uh, information can uh, unfortunately be lost. So 
Certainly, if you're working on it at, uh, on the same application at different times, you can work on it from different computers, um, and that, that's certainly fine. You just need the, the login information. But uh, we strongly recommend against having two people working on the same application at the same time. Okay, good to know. We don't want any head desk moments. Okay, is there a way to attach more than one letter of support? Yes, yeah, so there are, there are a few ways that you can do this. Um, one is to create, uh, to, to move all of your letters of support into one document, or usually one PDF, um, and then you can just attach that one uh, PDF to the, uh, to the application uh, form. Um, that's, that's kind of the easiest way. Um, however, if, if you want to submit them uh, individually and you do run out of space on the application form, you can simply submit any additional uh, letters of support uh, via email directly to the, the program office, and then we will uh, just attach that manually to your file. Okay, great. Moving on to another topic, supporting documents. So well, that's a nice little segue there, because a letter of attachment, a letter of support is a supporting document. Uh, those council resolutions, when are they due by? So there. So again, the. We would prefer that they be submitted with the, the application uh, by the deadline of July 31st. However, if your council is not meeting before then and you're unable to, uh, to obtain a resolution, we have provided an extension until August 31st, uh, 2018. Um, and we just ask that when you submit your application in the section that's um, focused on the resolution, that you just provide us with a, a timeline for when you will be able to provide us uh, with a completed resolution uh, for the project. Okay. So can resolutions of support from the past, either from your council or your board of directors, can they, they be used from the past or do we need a fresh resolution? Um, so for each intake, we, we do require uh, a new resolution that shows support for the project. Just because um, if, if there's been a resolution of support in the past, um, you know, from our, our standpoint, we don't know there could have been a change in leadership or a change in direction. And so it's not clear to us that that support is current um, and, and it's not, and that the support is, is for this specific application. So that's where we do require that a, a, an updated resolution be provided for the specific application that's being submitted at this time. Okie dokie. Um, how do we send the most recent annual report? Um, so the, the easiest way to do that is to, uh, to submit the document through the, the online application portal. Um, if for whatever reason, if the document is too large, um, you can submit it directly to the program via email. Uh, but the easiest way to do that would be to submit uh, a scanned copy of, of that document uh, through the, the online application form. Okay. I cannot mail you a printed copy of my annual report. No, unfortunately not. Okay. Online documents, got it. Okay, uh, on to cost eligibility uh, or things to do with cost eligibility. Uh, what kind of procurement processes do we need to use? Can we direct a word to say a consultant that we've worked with you know, on an earlier phase of the project or do we have to go out to tender on mul get multiple quotes, that sort of thing? Uh, so the, the procurement process is, is really uh, dependent on the internal processes of the the, app, the uh, organization that receives the funding. Um, we don't, uh, the provincial requirements do not kind of uh, get passed along to the applicant organizations. It's really up to, to each organization to uh, follow its own procedures for uh, procurement for how uh, they want to move forward with those funds. Um, if you have multiple quotes uh, and you want to include those with your application, it certainly uh, makes your application stronger, but it's not a, a requirement. And again, once we uh, provide uh, funding uh, following the application intake uh, period, it's really up to, uh, to your organization for how you want to run that procurement process. Okay. Uh, can costs that are ineligible for rural development fund funding still be counted as applicant contributions? So on the budget form, as applicants fill out and detail their project costs, there is a drop down menu that allows applicants to detail how those costs are going to be funded. So you can select whether the cost is going to be paid using rural dividend funds, using an in-kind contribution, or from another source. 
Um, so costs that are ineligible for rural dividend funding, they can still be detailed in the budget form and perhaps even as still part of the applicant contribution. However, those costs, because they've been deemed ineligible um, for the purposes of rural dividend funding, they cannot be selected as having rural dividend funds purpose towards them. So yes, you can still detail costs that are ineligible for rural dividend funding as part of your applicant contribution, but still make sure that you're meeting that overall 20% or 40% if you're doing a partnerships project um, as part of that criteria as well. Okay, um, so here's about a specific type of cost. It says speaker costs are eligible, but conferences or events aren't. What's the difference? Um, so the, the program has, has uh, tried to stay away from funding large events or large conferences, um, just because it doesn't really fit within the, the scope of the, the program. In terms of speaker costs, uh, this is more kind of to support um, projects that are focused on either uh, workforce development or training initiatives or lunch and learn sessions for local businesses or entrepreneurs. And so for those uh, types of, of uh, projects, often they will want to bring in a, a speaker or, or, um, or a, a specific teacher for, for one of those events. And so those sorts of, of costs for kind of a, um, uh, a one-off uh, speaker for as part of a, a series, a learning series or a, a training series that certainly makes sense and fits within the program, but large events or conferences just uh, don't quite fit within the, the rural dividend program. Okay, uh, moving on to another theme, the funding disbursement, the paying of the money. Uh, is there going to be consideration to balancing where the funding is dispersed throughout the provinces? Um, and so are there limits to how much a region or an individual applicant may receive sort of based on where they are? Um, so when we uh, make our funding decisions, certainly we do look to, to ensure that, that funding is distributed throughout the province. Um, that being said, there is no formal uh, kind of formula for how uh, funding is distributed. So um, if you know of, uh, of other applicants in your community or your region that are applying, certainly um, don't uh, get discouraged that, that you can't apply as well. Um, really, uh, the, the main uh, determinant in, in whether a project gets funded is the, the quality of the application and the, the strength of the proposed project. Um, and so, it's, while we do have a, a bit of a consideration around geographic distribution, it, it's, it's not uh, kind of the, the key factor. Okay. It's not a showstopper, in other words. Okay. Yes. Uh, when? When are the funds going to be dispersed? So again, uh, we'll be moving into our review and assessment process right after the intake closes on, on July 31st. Um, this is a bit of a, a new uh, process for us because we, uh, in the past we've done two intakes and this year we're only doing one. And so we're not quite sure of the, the uh, number of applications that we will receive. So um, our estimate now is that uh, we're going to be looking to have uh, the assessment process uh, going from late summer into the fall with uh, with funding decisions announced uh, later in the fall. Okay. And um, if I am a super keener, can I get my project started before any funds are dispersed or before I find out if I have the funding? So once an applicant submits their application um, through the online application form, you are able to start incurring project costs, uh, but we just want to caution that if you have incurred costs once your application has been submitted, and then you later find out after the review and assessment process that unfortunately the application was not successful, then those costs would need to be paid through other sources. Okay, so I won't spend money that I haven't been awarded yet. Unless you're really, really excited. <laughs> well, I'm not going to come back and say, but I spent money thinking you were going to give me money. Right. Okay. Um, so when I'm putting in my own funds, the sources of my 20 or 40% contribution, those gas tax dollars, is that eligible to be applied towards my uh, applicant contribu contribution amount? 
Yes, so the, the Community Works uh, Fund portion of the gas tax uh, dollars, um, since that's provided on a, a per capita basis to communities, that can be applied towards the, the applicant uh, contribution amount. Okay, even though that is a provincial slash federal amount? Yes, since it's provided on, again, a, a per capita basis, then then those are really kind of, uh, we view that as as operational funds that the that municipalities can uh, allocate as they see fit. And so if they've determined to allocate them to this project, um, then uh, that's not an issue. It's more when, when other funds have been provided from the federal or provincial government specific to the project, um, that's where, uh, where it's not eligible. Okay, so Western Diversification Funds? Western Diversification, uh, those are, again, um, that's a, those are federal funds, so they would not be able to be included in the applicant contribution. Okay. So again, uh, the, the applicant contribution can include the provincial or federal government funds. Okay, what about things from non-government sources like the Economic Development Trusts? Yes, yeah, so those... Those are definitely eligible to be included as part of your applicant contribution. Um, any of the, the development trusts throughout the, the province or any other not-for-profit sources that may be contributing funds, um, those can certainly be uh, included as part of the applicant contribution. Okay, and what about in-kind contributions? How do they factor into the, the percentage of applicant contribution? So the, uh, for the single applicant stream, uh, applicants are required to provide a 20 per, uh, provide an applicant contribution of 20% of the total project cost, and up to 10% um, of that 20% can be through in-kind contributions. For the partnership funding stream, applicants are required to provide uh, an applicant contribution of 40% of the total project cost, and again, um, a maximum of 10% of that 40% can be provided through in-kind contributions. Okay, so you really have to have some capital. You've yeah. got to put money in. Okay, um, you can't just use your photocopier as your co applicant contribution. Okay, yeah. uh, all right, so for different funding streams, um, is there a limit to the amount of funding we may wish to apply for? Yes, so um, we have three funding streams. Uh, the first funding stream is uh, our project development funding stream, and that provides uh, a smaller amount of money, a maximum of 10000 um, and so that's really intended to help uh, communities or organizations complete the preliminary work to support uh, a larger project that will be pursued uh, in the future. So, you know, completing a feasibility study or a business case, uh, it's really meant to help uh, communities that, that have an idea for a large project really kind of do those initial steps to, to get it off the ground. And then you can either come back to, to our program or to other funding programs for um, support for the implementation of the, the larger project in the future. Uh, the second funding stream is the single applicant funding stream. And the maximum funding uh, amount for the single applicant stream is $100,000. Uh, but as we uh, discussed earlier, there is a required applicant contribution of 20% of the total project cost, which can be provided through in-kind and financial sources. Um, and the uh, single applicant stream is, is, again, for applicants to undertake a, an economic development or diversification-focused uh, project. And then finally, we have our partnership funding stream, uh, which has a maximum funding of $500,000. Uh, and the applicant con required applicant contribution is 40%, which, again, can be through uh, financial and in-kind contributions. And so that's where uh, an eligible applicant is applying in partnership with at least one eligible partner. And so, therefore, they're they're able to access uh, an additional amount of funds. Okay, cool. Um, now, there's the special circumstances stream. What are what are what is that about? What are the funding ceilings for that stream? Does the application differ? So, the special circumstances funding stream uh, was set up really to support um, rural communities that are facing a significant economic crisis either resulting from the loss of a major employer, so a mill or a mine, um, or the, the impacts of uh, natural disasters, so floods or wildfires. And it, the special circumstances stream allows uh, the program to provide funding directly to communities that are dealing with the crisis outside of the parameters of, of the, the rural dividend program. So mainly it means that we're able to be more responsive and provide funding on a timelier basis. 
um, because we're able to provide funding kind of outside of the, the regular intake period and, and, and provide support as, as soon as possible. In terms of the, the funding ceiling, um, to date, uh, the MAC, we have not provided more than 500,000 um, uh, through the special circumstances stream. So that's consistent with the maximum amount provided through the, the regular intake uh, period. And really, again, special circumstances is, is for those communities that are really um, dealing with a, a, a significant crisis and are looking for immediate support. If you, if you have an application that fits within the regular intake period, uh, and that, that may be uh, the most appropriate uh, process for, for receiving funding. Okay, great. A uh, couple if questions. Any, oh. Sorry, just to add to that, if there are any communities that, that are wondering if, if they would fit within that stream, uh, we definitely encourage them to, to contact the program office and we can discuss it uh, further with them. Okay, good. Yes. When in doubt, contact the program office. Uh, and that's rural development, rural dividend at gov.bc.ca, right? Yes. Okay. I just thought I'd mention that again since we don't have it up on the screen. Uh, a couple questions about multi year projects. Uh, when multi year projects are funded, how is the funds dispersed over the two years? Um, so our, our funds are distributed uh, as, as a grant. So the funds are provided. Uh, up front, so after um, applicants are informed that they've been successful, uh, then we work with them to develop a comprehensive grant agreement to lay out uh, how the project will be implemented. And then they're provided with, with funds and uh, they're responsible for uh, managing those funds over the, the two year time frame for the, the program or for the project. Okay, and as you see, I've asked a couple more questions here. What are the interim reporting requirements after year one, and what are the reporting requirements at the end? Do you have to provide audited financial statements? What do you have to do? So uh, for each year that the project is underway, the applicant is required to submit two interim reports, um, one at the end of November and one at the end of May. And so that in those interim reports will really kind of detail the progress of the project to date and will provide uh, accounting and, and financial details regarding how the, the funds have been spent. Um, after the, the project is completed, then uh, the applicant is required within two months of the, the completion date to submit the, the final report um, for, the, uh, for the project, which outlines again what was, what was completed, what was accomplished, and to provide a, a thorough accounting for, for how the funds were spent. Um, again, applicants who are applying for uh, more than 100,000 uh, in funding are required to have audited financial statements for their organization. However, the, um, the final report and, and the financial and, and auditing information in there does not have to be independently audited. That being said, uh, we do have an audit function for our program. Uh, we recently completed an audit of uh, projects that were funded in the first year of the program it, with the assistance of, of the Ministry of Finance. And so, and we will have an annual audit um, going forward. So um, it is just something to keep in mind that uh, there is a randomized uh, audit process. Um, and uh, as part of the grant agreement developed with each applicant, um, they are required, uh, all applicants are required to participate in that process if selected, and, and, and uh, their uh, financial information can be reviewed uh, in detail at that time. Okay, you may be audited. Good thing to know. Uh, okay, so if a multi-year project was funded in the past, in an earlier intake, and it's still active, uh, how should we frame an application for sort of the same project but a further phase of it? Uh, so applicants can definitely uh, pursue a second phase uh, to follow up on, on a project that was previously funded. Um, there are a few things that, that you should keep in mind when developing an application like that. One is to very clearly differentiate what was accomplished in phase one and what will be accomplished in phase two, just so that it's clear to us that we're not funding the, the same project twice, um, just to kind of differentiate uh, how you'll be moving forward with, with the next phase of the project. If the, the phase one is still active, you can apply for further uh, funding, but what we'll be looking at in the assessment process is to, is to see 
um, how much progress has been made on that first phase. If, you're, if you've made a lot of progress and you're nearing completion, then uh, certainly we may move forward with, with funding phase two. But if it looks like phase one is still at a very early stage, then we may look at, at, uh, at suggesting that you come back for a, a, for a later intake uh, for phase two once more of the, the phase one has been completed. Okay, thank you. A couple of questions about project types. We tried to make this not too specific, but there's a couple of things that came up. Uh, so people are interested in applying for funds for things like uh, developing a community plan for a rural community or developing an economic development strategy or perhaps implementing, um, developing and implementing part of the strategy. Are those eligible costs or eligible projects? Yes, definitely. So uh, applicants can, can pursue kind of developing a, a plan or a strategy through the project development stream. Uh, but if it's a, a larger project uh, that uh, additional funding is required, then certainly you can pursue that as a, a standalone project in the single applicant uh, funding stream. And we have funded, uh, again, uh, economic development strategies and the implementation of economic development strategies in the past. So that, that, that would fit uh, well within the scope of our program. Oh, good. Okay. Um, what if... What if we have four sub-projects under one project title? Uh, how do we explain that? Can so again, that? <laughs> uh, they're certainly eligible or certainly able to, to do that, to have a project with, with multiple sub-projects underneath it. Um, again, that's just where we would really be looking for a very clear kind of uh, description of, of what each sub-project um, encompasses, what are the activities, um, and just differentiating uh, throughout the application, um, you know, what the timelines are for each of those sub-projects, what are the milestones for each of those sub-projects, just so that it's very clear to us um, what are the specific components and, and, uh, and again, what will be completed with each of the, the sub-projects. It's um, probably just, a, again, a, a bit of additional explanation may be required, but it's certainly possible to submit uh, an application like that under the program. Okay. Good. Um, finally, things about selection. Can you share the rubric for ranking applications? Uh, so uh, we can't share the, the rubric, uh, unfortunately, but we do have a, a section in the program guide that does outline the selection uh, criteria at, at, at a high level and, and identify some of the key project uh, or third program objectives and components that we are uh, looking at as part of the review and assessment process. All right, this will not be decision by dartboard. <laughs> you have yeah. criteria. Good, good, excellent. Uh, and finally, can you provide some examples of successful projects in the past or where can people go to find out more about projects? So all the projects that have been funded to date are uh, listed on the program website uh, under the, I believe it's uh, funded projects tab. Uh, and so there's all the projects there with a brief description and, and the amount of funding provided. And so that's really the, the best place to go to, to look at, at what sort of projects have been successful uh, so far to date in the program. Okay. I'm actually going to try and bring that up on my computer here and see if I can share that on our webinar, on our webinar here on the recording. So if I go to gov.bc.ca slash rural dividend, um, I will get directed to... I'm not going to share my browser quite yet. I'm going to try and find this and show it to people. Ah, okay. Showing my screen. Here we go. Uh, so if I'm looking at the website and I want to look at past projects, I can just go to BC World Evident and look at the funded projects section. And oh, look at yeah. that! Funded projects, lots and of so then different. We've got them broken down, just kind of um, by uh, by funding stream in, in each of the intake periods. And so you can just uh, click on 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 each link, and it'll take you to uh, to a, a complete list of the the projects funded to date. Okay, that's fabulous. Thank you very much. Oh, I'll have to down. Ah, it's an Adobe Acrobat document to download. Got it. Okay. So I'll just go back over to my presentation here. 
So um, that is all of the questions that we received for the webinar. I just want to thank uh, Matthew and Sarah for taking the time to uh, to host this webinar, as well your your team behind the scenes there who are, uh, aren't in front of the microphone. Um, thank you very much to the whole team at the Rural Policy and Programs Branch for uh, being part of our webinar series, and uh, we're really happy to support you guys in getting the word out there. This is a really key um, capacity building program for BC communities. Uh, before we go, I'm just going to tell you about a few things coming up. So if you're watching this recording, you can register for those. We're going to take a bit of a summer break and come back in September with some more webinars. We've got two scheduled already. The Tech Dev 101 series continues. So the links are there on your screen. Um, hopefully they're easy to write down and you can go to those URLs. Uh, they are case sensitive. So if you Put in a lowercase s for September, uh, you won't actually get to the link. So you have to write it down with exactly the capitals as shown. I just found that out today. Um, another thing, here's your summer homework after this, in addition to writing your grant application, is uh, we'd like you to complete a semi-annual survey on our webinars. How have you used them? Um, what outcomes have happened as a result of implementing ideas that you've heard about on a webinar or connections that you've made, also the format, uh, the timing of the webinars, the platform we're using, and as an extra bonus, I have listed all of the topics that I have under consideration for the fall and winter webinar series, and I'd like to hear from you what you think is the highest interest medium interest and low interest topics. Um, the webinar survey is at http colon backslash backslash bit.ly slash webinar checkup. And once again, you have to put in the capital W and C on webinar checkup, otherwise you will not get to the URL. Um, so that survey will be open until August 3rd. And uh, when we get back in August, I'm gonna be doing all the scheduling. So make sure you've had a chance to go and give me what you, what you wanna see. Um, if you wanna sign up for our future webinars, in case you found out about this from somewhere else or viewed it on our website, um, just follow this link, cm.pn slash three I-N-J and sign up and we'll make sure that you find out about everything coming up. Um, we will be recording, we have been recording this, and we will be posting the recording uh, to YouTube video and sharing the links on our economic development website on the, uh, the past recordings or recorded webinar series. And so you'll be able to go there and see, um, watch this again as many times as you want after today. Uh, it'll take us a couple of days to get this online, but uh, feel free. Uh, that is all we have today. So thank you very much for joining us on the session. And once again, uh, if you have any questions, this is uh, the email address that gets to my branch at the Economic Development uh, Design Coordination Outreach Branch. Uh, but you can also email ruraldividend at gov.bc.ca if you have specific questions about the program. Uh, if I get an email from someone, I will obviously send it over to my friends over at Glenrow Erdy. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us and watching.